Good morning, church. So we got back last night about 9.30, uh, about 14 hours in, in two church vans. We took 21 uh, people. We had 15 students and six adults, and we had a great trip um, down to South Padre is the area that we uh, kind of worked in with the, um, the mission area, but we were rarely on the resorts. We, we, we went to the beach that last day, but mostly we served a bunch of um, young Hispanic kids uh, in the neighboring town. And so it was incredible to see kind of the transformation and the growth in our students over the, the short four days that we, that we served there. Um, the first night... Uh, we were at kind of a youth pastor gathering at the Generate camp we went to, and they asked us youth pastors, all right, what do you want to see in our students? And I, um, I, I kind of, I said, I want to see our students have courage. I want them to be bold in walking out their faith and willing to have conversations. And it was an affirmation of how God was going to work um, that night whenever Ed Newton was a, was a speaker at this camp. And and he, well, his last point was um, to be bold. And every single one of our students um, took steps in their boldness uh, for Christ this week. Uh, we served in three different places. We served at a uh, VBS with a local church. We served at kind of a YMCA and did a sports camp. And then um, there was a few students who we stayed at a local church, and there was a few students that were part of their student ministry that they, we just kind of walked alongside and served with um, during the week. And almost every student shared their testimony at some point, whether it was to a big group, whether it was to their small group of five kids. Um, they took those steps, and that's the thing that they really hadn't done before. But we challenged them and encouraged them, and we built them up, and, and they, they delivered. Um, not, we, we can never know uh, the long-term effects of what a mission trip does. Um, we can't know if a heart was truly changed, but we saw, like, physical change in the students after spending time with us. Um, the last day, Caleb asked, all right, do y'all know why we came? And they were like, Jesus, we were at a YMCA. We, we were at sports camp, but they knew our message because our students had been talking to them every single day about why they were there and what they wanted for them. And, and through that, we had nine professions of faith. Like, so, absolutely round of applause. Like I said, we can't know they're forever, but I do know, I had a picture of uh, me and Freddie, uh, and I handed him and his little brother Richard a Bible, and I was like, so did you, did you talk to your mom last night? And he was like, oh my gosh, she was so excited. Um, and he was wearing a cross necklace, and he said, I'm, she's going to get Richard one too. Uh, and then... You, it gives you encouragement whenever they start to ask, like, what happens if I didn't have a chance to tell my friend who died from COVID? So, like, very, like, heart-wrenching, but it's like, the dude gets it, you know? Like, he has a heart and ha has a longing, and yeah, he doesn't understand the whole gospel, but he understands who, who Jesus is and who, what it means to him and that he longs for other people to have that. And so it was so encouraging to see those little steps, to see our students um, be like, hey, we need to buy these two girls' Bibles. Uh, we, we need to, so it was just over and over they delivered. So it was encouraging to see the growth in these students. It was so great having Doug Hale come drive and spend time with our students. Um, I think I'm pretty cool, but Doug, like, outshone me this week. Uh, if, if you notice, he was in every picture, and uh, he's, he was every student's favorite individual. I had some great college leaders, my two interns, Ethan Vines and Taylor Stricker, um, and Jimmy Cope came to help. Um, Caleb Fisher always says yes and is a great driver. So I just want to say thank you, church, for supporting our, ch our youth. Um, we couldn't do this without you and without your giving um, and without your prayers. Uh, but, and seriously, this, trips like this is what transforms our body, the capital C Church body, uh, serving alongside one another. Because the part I didn't ask, like, we went with 26 other individuals from FBC Hobart. And so there's nothing better than doing ministry together. Um, we do it so well here, but to pull other churches in and walk alongside each other, it was it was a sight to see. Uh, we are all so tired, um, but f absolutely fulfilled um, with, with what we got to do this week. So I want to say again, thank you. Can y'all give a round of applause for all the students who served this week? Um, so again, thank you. 
Uh, just one quick thing. We have a D group leader meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. We have, if you are participating in D groups, you don't even have to be the one in charge. But we just love for you to come have conversations in the community that way. And that's about it. So if y'all stand and pray, uh, I'll pray, and then we'll get started with worship. God, I want to thank you for, for Jesus and how, man, he can transform he can change hearts. He can, he can mold and build, it, whether we're present or not. But it's so great that he invites us in to participate in the sharing of his truth and the sharing of his love. And so it was, it was so great to be a part of a church who loves to serve and who loves to go. And Lord, I, 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 my desire is that we all do this together, that we're, we are going constantly throughout the year. Um, not just people in need, but also people in our local community, that we, we have that desire um, to reach the nation, starting with every individual that we know. So, Lord, I, I thank you for a student ministry that loves serving you. I thank you for a church body that loves serving you. And ultimately, I thank you for providing us a place that we can walk hand in hand, unified, cr- with great courage to know that, man, what we're working for is far greater than any earthly gain or earthly recognition, but Lord, you alone will provide. So God, I love you and I thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I hear Doug has a mean crossover and fadeaway jumper. That's what they told me. So I, I'm one, one on one, Doug, you in? Let's go. You're, he said he's in. You heard it here first, folks. I think he'll probably win. <laughs> but uh, it was so fun to, to see those photos and to, uh, to see these, these kids, uh, you know, living on mission. So uh, as, as Seth said, thank you to everyone that was uh, involved in that. Uh, we're going to worship this morning. Let's open our hearts uh, and, and open our hearts to Jesus this morning as we sing together. Let every heart adore. 
welcome in your heart this morning. Welcome Jesus. Sing it out. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Oh my God in love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Oh my God in love, be welcomed in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul awake. Oh my God in love, be welcomed in this place. See, it's not my life to live. It's not my life to live. next song, uh, So Will I, um, you know, God can make commands not only all of us, but he commands every grain of sand on the beach, every molecule, every speck of anything in this universe, he commands it. Um, so if creation sings his praises, we will too. So let's sing together. God of 
creation there at the start before the beginning of time with no point of reference we spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life and as you speak As you speak, a 
hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you so alive I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art Precious one, the child you died to say. If you gave your life to love him so alive, I can do it again a hundred billion times. I would measure could no amount to your desire. Father, we just thank you that, that you are the lamb that, that we are so unworthy, and that we have your blood shed on Calvary to bring us to you, for you are the only one who is righteous, Father. I'll be with Earl as he brings the message this morning. Let the gospel flow through him. Let us receive that well. Be with us as we absorb the Lord's Supper today. We love you. We praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. We will be observing the Lord's Supper together at the conclusion of the sermon. And I feel that's appropriate for the text we have today in Acts chapter 15, which emphasizes the church united. Uh, the church uh, expanded during the, as we have recorded in the book of Acts, uh, beginning with a group of Jewish uh, men and women who were followers of Jesus. It expanded to include Gentiles and Samaritans and all people. And then as the church began to grow, continued to grow, they have some issues debating about what exactly does it mean to be a uh, a Christian, do you, what it means to be a follower of Christ? Do you need to go back and obey all the Old Testament law? Do you need to uh, go through that dietary law and all the things that the Pharisees added to it? Do you have to obey all of those commandments? Do you have to be a fully practicing Jew to be a real follower of Jesus? Uh, they followed the evidence as a church and the leaders of that church, and they realized that no, you don't have to do that, that it, you truly are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And they come to that conclusion, and then they send back a document that states that, and they're going to send that back to the primarily Gentile church in Antioch uh, from Jerusalem. And when they send that, they not only send the document, they also send some people. Because there is still, even in this age of technology, uh, we're not live streaming today because the internet's down right now. The lightning storm. Did that one hit? Did that one hit really close to your house on Friday morning? I, it did me. Uh, but anyway, we don't have that. But in this world that includes text messages and emails and uh, Facebook and all these other things, there is still no substitute for personal one-to-one -one contact. And if you know how to, 
If you have some people skills and you can relate to people, it is to your advantage, and that's true not just out in the world and in your family. That's also true in the church. And so the church has the insight that they send not just a document, but they also send some people with it. So as we look at this morning in Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 22, I'll read through verse 35. The account is kind of a kind of like plowing the same ground again from last time, but that was three weeks ago. Uh, uh, but um, I, I, well, I'll just say this: a guy told me the other day about a preacher that, toward the end of his ministry, he had memory problems, and the last year he was there, uh, he preached every sermon from the twenty-third Psalm. So if this is similar, but it's not the same thing as last time. So so I'm not I'm not there yet. So but uh, Todd, you have the you have the authority. If I use the same text fifty two weeks in a row, you can take me aside someday during the week and tell me to get on down the road. Or I can stay here, but this can't come up here. Uh, so anyway, so this is a little it's different, but it's kind of the same situation. Verse 22 says, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas leading Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. And here's the letter they wrote. This is their conclusion. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we've heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, these people had gone there and told them that you have to practice all the Old Testament or you're going to hell. I mean, that's basically what they said. And says they have unsettled you. That word unsettled means bankrupt. So they have, they, it's a major deal that made them feel empty as spiritually. So we didn't tell them to do it, but they went up there anyway. It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. So there's the personal one-on-one. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you do well. Farewell. That's it. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers who were to those who had, been sent, who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. The early church uh, rallied around the gospel in order to make disciples of Jesus. Uh, We need, as a church today, big church, little church, all those who are followers of Jesus, we must rally around the gospel, the good news about Jesus, in order to make disciples. Uh, Three things in this text. Uh, The church uh, needs unity. Unity requires cooperation, and cooperation magnifies truth. First of all, the church needs unity. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 17, he prayed that those who were his followers would be one, even as the Father and Jesus were one. He even prayed for those who would come later, including you and me, that when we, that we would also be one. And the point being, he says, that the world may believe that you sent me. The church needs uh, unity. Uh, Jesus prayed for that. Uh, the church needs unity in the midst of diversity. We are all different Uh, physically. We all look different. We have different passions and desires and wants and needs in life, uh, various things that are different in us. Uh, We are gifted differently even as followers of Jesus. We have different spiritual gifts. We have different strengths and weaknesses. And yet in the midst of that diversity, the church needs unity. Uh, In this particular early church, you have those whose background was very conservative as far as being Jewish. Uh, They had been to the synagogue. They had learned the Old Testament. They had followed various practices. When they came to a certain age, they went through a ritual where they became a uh, full-fledged Jew. Uh, All of these laws, the dietary laws, the way they washed their hands, everything was very important to them. And then you have the other coming in, the Gentiles, who were raised. They had nothing really 
nothing to do with God. They were raised in, in a situation where they practiced idolatry. They were very immoral in the things that they did. Not necessarily every individual, but for the most part, that was the culture they came from. And they come from these wide differences, and yet in the midst of diversity, the church needed unity. That they realized we can't, be go- we can't, have, uh, we can't have the Gentile branch and the Jewish branch and go our different ways. We all, we've got to come together some way and be able to fo- focus on uh, what God has asked us to do. And so nobody's saying that we're, that we're not different. We are. And, but in the midst of that diversity, as we focus on the gospel, the good news about Jesus, there is a unity that the church needs. The church has to be unified. Uh, we're in a world now where darkness is having its day. Uh, Satan is he's just seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not just seeking to do it. He's He's succeeding. Never has it been more necessary for the church to be united around the, the commitment to Jesus Christ and to stand our ground and to be able to declare the gospel, live the gospel. Uh, the church needs unity in the midst of diversity to make disciples. The way we make the, our focus is to make disciples, those who are learners, they come to know Christ as Savior, they grow in their faith, they reproduce as far as others who also follow Jesus Christ, and that's why we have to have unity. Again, Jesus, when he prayed, he prayed and said that they may know that you have sent me. That's why they need to be united. Everybody has to be in this together because when they, a church that is divided is a church that is defeated. And by that, I don't just mean a local church. I mean the church overall. Every church where Jesus is Lord needs to be united in the focus on uh, the making of disciples. And for us to be successful in doing that, there has to be this focus on uh, unity and keeping Jesus at the center of that as far as everything that we do. Uh, it's mentions here in verse 25, it talks about Paul and Barnabas and says, those who risk their lives for our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that the focus, what kept them going, what they did was their love for Jesus. It wasn't that they thought that Lystra was a great place to go or this, this, you know, they wasn't the other things that were around them, it was their commitment to Jesus, their love for Jesus. And what should motivate us in being united, what, what we can rally around, is our love for Jesus Christ. Uh, when Peter had his one-on-one time with Jesus uh, in John chapter 21, Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me? He didn't say, do you, do you like sheep? He didn't say, do you think you'd be a good minister for the rest of your life? Do you think you'd be good at this? He said, do you love me? And that's the question we have to continue to answer is, God doesn't ask me, Earl, do you think that the church is doing well and you like the color of the carpet? He asked me, do you love Jesus? What keeps me going is, do you love Jesus? Uh, several years ago when we had... A lot of young couples having kids, and I was kind of kidding and kind of not, and I was, trying, I was lobbying uh, to get somebody to name if they have. I said, if you have a son, why don't you name him Earl? And, uh, uh, well, nobody, I got one guy to name an Australian blue shepherd, blue healer dog, Earl. Uh, as close as I get. And that, so I was like, what? Because my, my children showed me how you can look on the Internet or whatever, and Earl was one of the most popular names back in the early 50s. It was, it was rocking it. Uh, and so in the midst of all this, uh, I asked Nancy, I, I said, well, you like the name Earl, don't you? And she said, I love you. <laughs> don't care much for your name, but I love you. And there'll be things in the church where you say, I don't care much for that, but I love Jesus. That wasn't my, fa- that wasn't my favorite, but I love Jesus. You're not going to get me to quit because I love Jesus. That's who I'm here for. I'm not here so that, you know, for any other reason than that. And so the church needs unity in the midst of diversity to make disciples. Secondly, unity requires cooperation. And it says in verse 25, having come to one accord. So it wasn't something that naturally happened. It didn't just, oh yeah, we all love each other and we all think the same way and we're all exactly alike. No, it's they, they came to one accord. They had different viewpoints they come and they discuss and then they, they come to one accord. Unity requires cooperation. So they come at this and they cooperate with one another and come out of it unified. 
to discuss divisive issues. They had to discuss and walk through what does this mean to be a follower of Jesus and how does that relate to the fact that Jesus was a Jew. He comes out of the same background as the Pharisees and yet now you're saying you're saved by grace through faith plus nothing. How, do, how does that work? And I, I would think someone raised their voice during, the con- during that conference in Jerusalem. But they didn't ignore it. They didn't stick their head in the sand. They talked up front about that and then they work through it. One of, the, one of the problems in our world today is people desire absolute conformity to everything that they believe or they hate your guts. I mean, that's kind of how the deal is. It's like, I can't believe you. It's like, Whoo. and so what happens? Everybody just kind of cows down. It's like, I won't say anything because I, I don't like people yelling at me. You know, I don't, I don't. That's not the way it has to, that's not how it should work in the church among local church, large church, Anything that's, that's controversial, we need to be able to talk and talk through it so we can remain united. Over 25 years ago, when I was a pastor in Holdenville, God convicted me uh, that it was not right that we keep rebaptizing people that had already been baptized biblically. That they were baptized by immersion as a testimony of their faith after they were saved. And I, my lead-in to some of them was, it, this isn't what the Bible says, but this is how we do it. And then finally, it's like, what am I doing? So, it's like we had some discussions, and we talked it through, and we realized that if somebody comes from another background, it, you don't have to get baptized in Baptist water to be a fully follow, full follower of Jesus. You don't have to do that. So, so anyway... When we were in the midst of that, there was a retired preacher who was in the church there in Holdenville. And he told me, he said, Earl, you're right, biblically. But there's the possibility that this could cause some people to get upset. And it's, well, when he said you're right, biblically, to me, that's the ball game. We're done. I mean, I'm not worried about how... And then also, here's the other fact, and he was a friend of mine, is I thought, if you would have dealt with this 40 years ago, when you were my age, we wouldn't be messing with it right now. Don't be afraid to discuss things. I so appreciate people in the church who come and talk to me about something. I mean, I appreciate that. I think that's wonderful. That's the way the world is supposed to work. I'm not afraid to talk to people about things that I don't agree with, that what they're doing. But... Unity uh, requires cooperation to discuss divisive issues. So we discuss it. Secondly, to communicate expected behavior. Uh, It says in verse 29 uh, that they send this document, and it says when when they tell the Gentiles at the church in Antioch to abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols. Pagan people at that time would offer meat to idols, the sacrifice, And then, uh, good businessmen that they were, they would sell it at a discounted rate. Nothing wrong with the meat, but it had been offered to an idol. And they said, for the sake of unity, just bypass the budget aisle in the supermarket of the meat offered to idols. Just skip that, you know, because it's not going to make you where you're lost if you do that, but it'll be a point of contention. So stay away from that. Then when it says that they, and from, from blood and from what has been strangled, the Jewish mindset of the Old Testament in Leviticus, life is in the blood, so you drain all the blood out of any animal that you eat, because if you don't, then you're eating life, and that, that was offensive to them. And then it says, and from sexual immorality, because that was the reputation Gentiles had, but they were just loose, loose in their morals, and so don't, don't be doing that. If you do this, all will go well. Now, in reality, no Christian should live a life of of immorality, but it's like they singled that out because that was the sin they were famous for. And so they say, here's here's what's to be expected. And they say, if you do this, all's good. And and then the the way the Gentile church took that was, woo, yes! I don't have to go do all that other stuff. This is wonderful. And so they let them know what was expected. I find it significant also in verse 35 
where it says about Paul and Barnabas, they continued to teach and preach the word of the Lord with many others also. How we relay or how we communicate the expected behavior is through the word of God. Uh, the priority of teaching and preaching of the word of God here in a small group as you read the word of God, that determines what we're supposed to do. How our, our attitude, our actions, everything that we're to do uh, is to be determined by what does the Bible mean. You know, someone told me the other day, he said, the Bible never lies, but the Bible's been used many a time to lie. Uh, in the sense, you can, my dad used to say, you can make water run uphill if you just pick the right verses and string them together. So when you have a, an accurate understanding of the inerrant word of God, that is what is expected of us. That's why we keep coming back to church. That's why we keep reading the word of God. That's why we keep preaching the word of God. That's why I don't write my own material. I go by what's said here is because that communicates to us what's expected uh, to us. And that helps us to cooperate when we come together because what the Word of God says determines the direction that we go in life, the direction we go as a church, First Baptist Church, Weatherford, the direction that the church goes, the worldwide church of all who are followers of Jesus. Unity requires cooperation. To limit personal liberties. These things that the the leaders of the church asked the Gentile church in Antioch to do had nothing to do with their salvation. This was not anything to do with whether they were going to go to heaven or not. They were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But these other things that they asked them to do, to bypass the meat that had been sacrificed, the idols that was going to be offensive uh, to the Jewish Christians to not eat a really raw steak, you know, rare steak. Don't do that because that could be offensive. And then... You know, this whole deal, when they said that about immorality, that could have been offensive to the Gentiles. Like, what are you blaming me, grouping me in with all these people that practice idolatry? So, but the reason he did that, why they did that, they wanted a bridge to be built between the, two, the, the Gentiles and the Jews as they followed Jesus. They're wanting to build bridges. Uh, we are not to live in such a way that we are offensive to other people needlessly. Um, you may not get the cheapest meat to eat, but you're not eating something sacrificed to an idol, and you, you avoid being offensive to others. You limit your own liberties. We follow Jesus. Jesus emptied himself and became a servant, and we are never more like Jesus than when we serve others. We are never less like Jesus than when we're demanding our rights because this is what I have coming to me and this is what I deserve. Uh, Jesus said, I'm among you as one who serves. Uh, those who lead out in this world, they demand their rights. They want first place. They want everything uh, that's coming to them. Those who follow me are willing to lose their life, and give up their life for the sake of building bridges into the lives of others. So, uh, the question is not, yeah, I've heard people even say that, well, if I do this, is this going to send me to hell? No. Let's get your theology straight here. How are you saved? By grace, through faith in Jesus. Once that's done, you can't add to it, you can't take it away. That, that, that's, we got that. But how you live can influence others and how they live and what they do. And so that's why we need to cooperate and remain united uh, because we limit our liberties uh, to do that. Usually, division between churches or in churches is not rooted in doctrinal disagreements as far as what the Bible teaches. But many times it is practical situations that are rooted in personal desires or preferences, you know, something that's about how I was raised or what I like best. Uh, and so division can come, but we can avoid that by limiting personal liberties. It's not about me. It's not about you. Um, I've spent my, my life trying to be as non-factor as possible when I share the Word of God. When I started out, my grammar was terrible. It's still not the best, but it's so much better than it used to be. And when I first started out, it was like, well, that's, that's who I is. That's my background. That's the way I'm, you know, that's this, you know, and... Uh, it's like, uh, I realize I want to be as non-offensive as possible in the things I say and the things that I do and to, be, to, to build as many bridges as possible. 
And so that's what we all should do. The church needs unity. Unity requires cooperation. And finally, cooperation magnifies truth. Uh, when we cooperate with one another, that focuses people, causes people to focus on the truth, the truth of how to know God and how to worship God. Uh, in the sense that Jesus said, I came to bear witness to truth, how to get to know God, how to serve God. And they focus on the truth instead of focusing on the division within Christians or difference of all the Christians not getting along. Um, it says in Titus chapter 2, verse 10, that it said to, to slaves that were Christians, it said, you will adorn the gospel by your good behavior. And it lists some things that they do, that when you do this, you make the gospel more attractive. Um, when I was in high school, I stopped by to pick Nancy up one day, and one of her older sisters uh, was drying her hair downstairs. I was waiting on Nancy. And uh, she had one of those old-fashioned hair dryers, and it looks like you've got a food covering deal on your head, and it has a pipe going up to it, and her hair was curled. And she had on no makeup. And I really thought somebody else was living in that house. It was like, I tried not to stare, but I couldn't take my eyes. I was like, is that really you? Because there was the same person, but that same person sure looked a lot different up at the Hobart High School than they did right there on that chair. I, it's, they, were, they, were, they needed adorned. Uh, the gospel is always the gospel. But when you live sacrificially, when you love one another, when you give to others, when you do what you're supposed to do, when we remain united and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, when we're glad to see each other, when we serve together, when we, we, when we cooperate and accept, when we do all that, man, we're putting makeup on the gospel. We're making the gospel where it's attractive, where people are like, I want some of that. I want, I want in on that. They know how to forgive each other. They give their second chances that are offered that, that, that adorns the gospel. Cooperation magnifies truth. The gospel truth. Again, the good news about Jesus, this church and the early church, the Jews and the Gentiles come together. We've got to figure this out. Here's all that's required. It is through faith in Jesus Christ that anyone can be saved. And that's what we need to magnify. And we don't need to be over in these other issues arguing about that. We want to focus on Jesus, that he came for all who have sinned and he will forgive and he will change from within. And that's what our focus needs to be. Uh, Mike Brown asked me on Monday at the men's breakfast, he said, do you play golf? And I said, nope. And I hadn't played golf since I moved to Weatherford. And here's why. I have a terrible slice, and I spend all my time out in, in the weeds. And I can't keep the ball on the fairway, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm no good. And I, I just quit. I can, uh, I, I can do other things better. The gospel is the fairway. We want to stay on the gospel. This is the truth. We are sinners. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus died for all of us who will place our faith in him. Our sins can be forgiven. We follow him for the rest of our life, sacrificially serving him. That's the gospel. We don't want to be over here in the weeds because it keeps you off mission. Just to be honest, it bugs me. Whenever I see that the Southern Baptist Convention, the leaders are all arguing about this, that, or the other this, this year or last year. I mean, and it's, not, it's not good PR for the rest of us when we're out here trying to win our friends to Christ and show them what's going on as far as how Jesus can change their life when everybody seems to be off in the weeds arguing about things that don't really matter about eternity. And that's just, I feel better now. Thank you. Uh, so... Cooperation magnifies truth, the gospel truth, and biblical truth. There is no more important truth in the Bible than the gospel, but there is more truth in the Bible than just the gospel. That is, the Bible speaks to race. The Bible speaks to justice. The Bible speaks to family. The Bible speaks to sexuality. The Bible speaks to all those things. And people will take us seriously about what the Bible teaches when we are a united church, united with all who share our faith in Jesus Christ, united as a church here, united with all the churches. I, again, this morning, every Sunday, I pray for every church 
uh, where Jesus is Lord by name here in the town of Weatherford because we need all the help we can get. Uh, again, I'm going to end where I started. The devil's having a heyday. Darkness seems to dominate. Now, how do we push back against that? With the gospel. United in our surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ individually and as a church and with other churches. As we conclude this morning, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. And as we do that, we're remembering that Jesus Christ, His perfect body in which He never sinned, He earned righteousness for us by the life that He lived, that we are... We are seen, if we place faith in Jesus Christ, we are seen as perfectly righteous, even as Jesus was, that his shed blood paid for the sins, all of the sins of everyone who ever places faith in him. And we, this morning, as we take that together, are remembering that it's only through what Jesus did for us that we are acceptable unto God. And then also it's a statement of unity that we are united in our surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus, I invite you to participate with us uh, as we take this together. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, then there's nothing to testify, so I advise you not to do that. Uh, but I'm going to pray, and uh, then uh, as we sing, remain seated, and as we sing, leaning on the everlasting arms, we're thinking about God and Jesus, that we're leaning on Him and thankful for Him. Uh, if you would hold your juice and bread, that's two cups. The bread's in the bottom one, the juice is in the top one. Hold that until all have been served, and then we will take that together after all have been served. God, thank you uh, for the unity that you bring into our lives with other people. Not because we root for the same team, or because we have the same occupation, or because we're the same age, but the unity through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the unity through the grace that you make available to all of us, that there are countless uh, brothers and sisters in this building today that I feel so close to because of sharing what Jesus has done for us. And so this morning as we observe uh, together what you told us to do, to do this in remembrance of me, we're going to do it because you told us to do it and we thank you for the privilege and I pray that you would speak to our hearts and help us to draw closer to you even this morning in Jesus name Amen What a fellowship what What a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms
What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. You take the bread. Uh, this is my body, which is for you. Uh, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Uh, Lord Jesus, as we conclude, we are thankful that we have been made acceptable and been made right with God the Father through the sacrifice you made for us on the cross. Help us never to forget that, never to get away from that individually and as a church and as the entire church, that we'd focus on that. We thank you for the day when you will return. And until that day, we're going to keep telling others and keep believing in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thanks for being here.